Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the feature toggling session. Next 50 to 60 minutes, we are going to explore feature toggling with the help of FF4J feature flipping for Java. And in this session, I am going to give some background and explain where feature toggling actually fits in this CI-CD equation. And then that, that would also give some perspective as to why I am doing this pre presentation. And I will quickly skim through use cases and then jump into a demo because this is going to be a demo oriented uh, presentation. So, I will not spend so much time on explaining theory, but I would show them in action. And then the most important thing of all is pitfalls. So, before you use any new framework or a technology, it is very important to know the pitfalls. So, I am going to cover that and I included some reference links. And as far as questions and answer, I would like to keep them towards the end of this session. And I am going to also be available outside for some time for any ad additional questions. About me, I am Ceci Perry. Like Nate Shuta always says, I am a SaaS, software professional as a service. And I work for Cardinal Health. And Cardinal Health distributes um, pharmaceutical and medical supplies. And we also manufacture surgical instruments. And our headquarter is in uh, Dublin. Um, however, our distribution centers are all over the world, about 60 countries. And it's a huge company. Not many people know, but it is uh, 14 ranked in Fortune, Fortune 500. And a disclaimer before I actually go into the presentation. Anything that I'm showing here and explaining is a general guideline and my opinion not uh, really tied to cardinal health and you are required to do your own thorough analysis before you implement this into your production grade applications. <laughs> I am covered now. <laughs> so, now into the topic. L little bit before we actually jump into feature toggling and FF4J, let us talk a little bit about CICD and separation of concerns. So, prior to CICD days, prior to CICD is been more popular what would you have done to do a production deploy? You would have checked out the code from the intended branch, compile it, and most importantly, you would have made some environment specific changes, and then create, package it, and push it SAP maybe to a node or multiple nodes, and then you realize you missed a comma or a semicolon, and you debug, and via smoke test, come back, make one more change for the environment, and then probably push it and which would have taken a whole weekend or probably a Friday night. But with CICD, in a perfect CICD world, it may take a button click or couple of button clicks on your favorite tool, CI tool or CD to CICD tools, Jenkins, Concourse. Uh, this morning we learned Spinnaker, one or combination of more, and promote the stuff into production. So, when I say stuff, what kind of stuff that gets promoted into production in a CI CD world? Probably the pre created artifacts that are um, supposed to be environment agnostic, and you would it, they are environment agnostic because you would have pushed your configuration um, into your Spring Cloud conflict server or such tools. So, now uh, all you do, uh, not only these pre-created uh, uh, artifacts are environment agnostic, but you would have tested the same artifact across the environments before it is actually moved, the same artifact is been moved into production. So, what is happening here is the separation of concerns I was talking about, at least two of them. The first one is that you separated your checkout, compile and create artifacts, packaging into your CI CD tools and push it that probably into your favorite tool like Nexus or Artifactory. That is a concern, a concern that is separated. And now, the next concern that is being separated here is your environment specific con configuration by pushing it into probably Spring Cloud configuration server, which you can refresh at runtime, right. Now, assume that your deployment is successful, now it is available. What do you think would happen to the functionality and the features that you, you had been developing? Do you think they are going to be immediately effective for the end user to be used? If your answer is yes, you are saying your deployment is synonymous to your release. Both are same. You deploy, they are available. And in that case, what happens if you find a bug, a very critical severe bug? 
like one of the three things you would try to if it is easy enough to be fixed you work whole night day and then you would fix it and branch release merge and all that and you would have pushed it but if it is too tough to be fixed you would have rolled back that feature and if it is even tough to actually roll back that feature isolate the feature you would have rolled back the whole release so what's happening here is that the release is controlling you you are not controlling the release you are not able to gradually release the features into production as and when you want rather the release is controlling you because it's effective immediately so that's where so how will you fix this by separating another concern that's the release concern from your deploy and how will you do that how will you actually separate your release from the deploy um the most easiest thing that you could think probably is that you would have created some um properties in your database or spring cloud configuration server and then you can on them off nest your code between your if else then and then uh, with spring, uh, spring cloud config server it is possible that you refresh it uh, uh, toggle on and off at run time with your actuator or something that's the most default thing easiest thing that would come to our mind right so if that is the case that's all you expect from the feature toggling why are there a whole lot of frameworks in the market just specialized some of them are most of them are commercialized and specialized doing just feature toggling and i'm standing here to do 60 minutes of presentation so we had this exact conversation when my manager jim shingler was asking me to build a spring boot custom spring boot initializer project as a pet project i did not want to do that for two reasons after all who wants to go uh, to ceci dot peri dot io or something not start dot spring dot io besides if josh lang is anywhere it would hurt his feelings immensely if you don't incorporate a little bit of spring dot start dot io start dot spring dot io into your life right so i did not want to do that instead i wanted to do the feature toggling so we had the same conversation he was asking like what do you expect this feature toggling to be done on off the feature toggle so i had a big laundry list of things that i wanted to do which i will go through like the laundry list um he said how long it will take to do this 12 months 16 months and he said go find a framework that does it so i said i looked at couple of frameworks either they don't do all that i am expecting it to do or they are not spring spring boot compliant or friendly why is it supposed to be spring spring boot and spring technologies we all know that spring comes with anything starter spring anything starter and it has auto configuration capabilities opinionated convention over configuration so it makes developers little lazy and it does things for you right it's all good these are all good reasons why it has to be spring but i have a separate reason that i will reveal at the end more important reason so then we were going through one after another each framework and then he stopped at ff4j and said go look into this framework and then see if it does everything you want to do so i went and i started digging into this framework and to my surprise actually to my disappointment cedric luven who is the creator of this open source framework thought about everything that i was thinking of and five times more he is much ahead thinking and he does a whole lot of things so now coming to ff4j it's apache v2 licensed it's very important to know before you use any open source framework what is it licensed under like more restrictive like lgpl gpl or here in this case it is apache v2 um now coming to certain use cases of feature toggling where they are useful this is not exhaustive list there are more but a quick glance to give a gist of where it would be useful at a broad level there are two types of feature toggling needs the first one is release based like for example you just want to hide a feature uh, because you are not just ready you started building a cat probably it is turning attending towards a tiger scope creep kind of scenario or your business just changed their mind just before the deploy uh, day they come to you and then say they 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 don't want to go live with a feature or couple of features and you want to hide them instead of not going ahead with the deploy and then you have canary religious blue green ab testing and rolling uh, deployments they are all examples of release based things and they are expected to be short lived that's an important thing here they are expected to be short lived and recycled and then the business type of feature toggling expected to live little longer 
and uh, one of the examples is dark launching dark launching is an interesting tricky technique for features that you actually want to test in production production is the best place to test certain things so you want to behind the scenes secretly launch it and collect your metrics for example an algorithm that you improved it's not performing so effectively to the end user nothing is changing you changed some some things technically so you want to put both of them and to release it randomly to certain percent of the users and collect the metrics when you are happy you increase the percentage until it is 100 so that's a technique and other uh, business uh, needs could be the business rules like predic uh, that would be evaluated like a predicate like sr no and then those business rules will trigger a release um, like rules uh, as a matter of fact, FA4J can seamlessly be integrated with the drills. So, the, those are a couple of examples of uh, use cases. And FA4J has, <coughs> FA4J addresses most of these things by creating strategies, is what they call starting from simple strategy to more complex strategies um, like AO base, AOP based toggling. And then it is very easy. What I found is that it is very easy to extend and put your own custom strategies. And now I will quickly jump into demo to show how it works in action. So to demo, I have a couple of Spring Boot applications. The most important ones are FA4J server. That's going to be the feature server. And then the Flipper web app. That's the client that is going to use these feature uh, features to toggle on and off. And all, uh, all the projects that you see here are uh, Spring Boot projects created off of Spring Initializer. And to uh, create the FF4J server, all I had to do is use the Spring Initializer to create the Spring Boot server. Because FF4J is not part of Spring Initializer, so I had to manually add FF4J Spring Boot starter. That's what I mean by why it has to be Spring Boot. It has a starter. And now I have, because I chose my feature store to be JDBC, I have FA4J Spring JDBC. And um, it's a time leaf based application. Similarly, uh, I have uh, FA4J web app that also has similar dependencies. And the configuration, I'll quickly show the configuration and what it takes to configure, is nothing. but just to tell where my feature store is using the regular spring way inject the data source uh, like you inject a data source in any spring application by configuring couple of properties that's all it takes to make my ff4j server and now on the client side i have similar configuration and i also have certain security ff4j spring boot security starter also integrated you will see why the security is important in a minute and it is spring uh, spring security enabled and they are running up and running i started pre started and this is how the ff4j server look like and my feature store and I pre-created certain features and then here is my client and I created a couple of users here this user here has a role admin and then I have another user here this has couple of roles it's a regular user not admin and has a role beta tester because the fact that this is admin it has more capabilities like edit add delete and all that now let's see each of these strategies one by one and how they work now i'm going to start with the simple strategy simple flip where like the situation where you tried building cat and you it tended towards basically you want to enable or disable a feature for the entire user base now let's see i enabled this and go back to this user something got enabled and I go to another user and something got enabled now that's a simple case let's say canary kind of situation where you want to enable features to certain uh, set of people your beta testing users for example 
so now I created the uh, so f of j has something like uh, um, it 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 has as you can see all it takes to create a feature it has a UI given name and then I assign under permissions specify a role that this feature is supposed to be available for and then so in the f uh, previous case I went to your feature I enabled but in a real uh, uh, real life situation it is not like one feature you may have a thousand of features or hundreds of features it is not very exciting for the software engineer to sit in the night although it is a easy thing to keep clicking the buttons. So, you want to uh, enable a group of features that are probably grouped under here in this case I grouped a certain features under R1 and you want to enable all of them. So, I am going to demonstrate how to uh, release a group of features for in this case beta testers. I have couple of features now to enable it to so, I selected R1 and so that group is being enabled. Now, let us see what happens to the first user that is admin who is not a beta tester. You see nothing. On the other hand, here the other user got couple of features. So, this is a canary kind of thing. <coughs> before I will go through the code and what it looks like, but let me show a couple of more strategies before that. Now, I have a client. So, FO4J has different strategies, client based strategies and server based strategies. Why are they important? Like in your blue green deployments or A B testing or rolling deployments, you may have needs where you want to enable uh, disable all the features for all the nodes or you may selectively want to enable features to uh, if the request is being served from a node or a certain region you may have those needs. So, you could whitelist or blacklist those servers or nodes. Similarly, you may have business requirements or needs where you want to enable certain functionality to the set of user base that is coming from a region versus the other region. For example, I want to enable a thing for the user base from California or probably um, uh, not for a different region to demonstrate that. So, it is not e I cannot easily demonstrate the node and the cluster scenario, but I could uh, demonstrate the client side of it. The they look similar as far as the creating the feature and using them. So, here in this case I am using client based strategy. So, FF4J has a whole lot of strategy. In this case it is a client uh, based strategy and I said if the user is coming from these configured clients enable the feature and this is more like a white listing. The opposite black listing is also possible by doing a not. Now, to simulate that let me first enable the client strategy actually it is already enabled when I enabled the R 1 the whole group. Now, let us see because it is enabled I do not see an extra feature here. There are still two features that are enabled the third feature you cannot see. To simulate it I have a remote desktop I set up um, which is in Columbus Ohio area. Now, I will log in as the same user and then see what happens. So, the when it is the same user, but then when logged in when the request is coming from a different client base they have a different uh, behavior. So, at this point I will show another strategy and then I will uh, go back to Claude to show how this is all done and then I do more. So, now there is another thing like the business use case these are all release based the business cases where for example, as you can see on the screen maybe I will uh, zoom a little bit. So, you have ff 4 has time date based strategies like office hour strategy like you want to enable something that is during office hours or you do not or you want to do something special off the office hours or a public holiday or weekends or um, more than anything uh, 
important thing is that you want to release a thing on a particular date and time that is like you probably did the deployment and you disable certain features and instead of on the day you want to release you sit up late in the night and clicking these buttons you want to enable them during the day but they will be available and be released when the time comes automatically how will you do that so i am using something called here the release based, st based strategy now this says the configuration says that when i enable this feature it will be actually released. This is enabled, that means released, but uh, scheduled to be released on 10.10. 10. Um, like today it is 10.8. Let's see what happens now when I, because I enabled the feature, nothing happened. But to simulate 10.10, 10, I'm going to go here and change the date. Now it is 10 10, system thinks it is 10 10. So they are automatically enabled when the time came. Now let us see a little bit uh, the code aspects of it, how this is all done. So, what are I demonstrated? majority of what I demonstrated is more of a UI except for the client strategy. So, FF4J has built in uh, tag libraries for JSP, but here in this case it is a time leaf and it also comes up with uh, pre uh, out of the box time leaf dialects, although I created some of my custom dialects in this case and it is very extendable and easily you can create your own dialects. And so once you create the dialects or use the out of box ones, all it involves to do the front end side of it is nothing but nest it within your time lift tag. So you give the feature name, these are predicates. So they will be evaluated to true if they are enabled. So nest your code between these predicates, that is all you have to do. I had to write no single code, but just nest them. That's for the uh, client side with the time leaf. Now on the server side, there are multiple ways of uh, doing on the server side. One way is that uh, the FF4J features can be auto injected. So the first line that you see is Boolean. That means that feature, it's be the predicate it is uh, is been evaluated and the value is already injected. So if CCF1 is enabled, it's there. So there is there are disadvantages of auto injecting it because the scope is more and the other way is that I inject FF4J and evaluate it as and when I need it. What I mean by that is some code like this. So check as you need them and in the client case, the client strategy case, what I did, what FF4J does is something like this. So it is going to be the similar thing for the server also. So you determine where is it coming from and inject that client into FF4J context and FF4J execution context and FF4J will take care of everything else. But now you would ask, how is this different from your if else in the config server, right? So now also you see if else, else if and they are not uh, easily detectable when you want to recycle them. So not pretty cool at. So FF4J has something called AOP, AOP based toggling where you do not have to do if else. We will see how that is possible by demonstrating via a different feature. So to demonstrate that, oh, before uh, I uh, show you how you can ch uh, change the system behavior at a larger scale without if else, I would quickly uh, talk about ponderation strategy. The ponderation strategy is where your dark lensing comes into picture. So what I am telling here is weight 5. That means it is 50 percent. So point 0.1 is 10 percent. So when I enable that, at random only 10 percent of users are going to see a behavior versus 90 percent will see still the old behavior. So that is one aspect. I can to, uh, make that together with the other thing that I am talking about is here I have something called, oh, let me turn it off first. So the system binary feature, in the beginning it is not enabled. 
Now, let's see what happens when I do this. 2. Is that correct answer? 1 plus 1, 2? How many of you think it is correct? How do you know? Because I have not told what, uh, what system it is based off of. If it is decimal, yes, 2 is correct answer. Maybe it is not, if that is not what the system is supposed to do. So, here in this case, it is assumed to be decimal. So, it is cor correct answer. Now, I will go and turn the system behavior to do binary. So, now it changed the system to binary. So, let us see how that can be done without if else's. So, here I have two implementations. One is my binary implementation and then the decimal implementation and then calculation service is the interface. And in my service implementation, I will see no code that has if else feature enabled or anything. None of the implementations will have any if else. Everything is happening magically based on what you see over there at the top, at the annotation. So, what this is telling me is that in my controller, what I inject is the calculation service and service dot add, but the implementation is figured out and known at runtime and the, the correct implementation is proxied and delivered. That is how it is happening. Do you recollect this similar syntax in any of the spring libraries that you may have used? How about Histrix? Somebody is saying there. So, Histrix, so it has similar, similar syntax as Histrix. So, you, you can have backup uh, feature 1, feature 2 and all that. And not only that, as a matter of fact, FF4J has FF4J spring hysterix starter. So, that means over and above you could have your circuit breaker and hysterix and all that. With that, I will pause here demonstrating the features. I have one more cool thing that I will show little towards the end. I will go over other capabilities of FF4J like monitoring. These are all built in KPS built. Here it is showing me which feature is being used. So, I said when you inject the feature, it has its own down, uh, downside. The CCF1 is injected at a, a little global level. It is always injected and evaluated. That is why you see 83 percent there uh, uh, compared to other features. And uh, like you have a KPS to tell which region is hitting more and so on and so forth. And you can customize KPIs. It is very easy to customize and create your own KPIs. And the other important thing is auditing. So, who is creating these features? Who is toggling them on and off? And all that is important also. And uh, before I demonstrate the uh, other thing, property store. So, feature, so here you see it, it has a lot more things that I do not have time to go over like import export. The import export is important when you are moving across the environments. Like you want to import all your features into a file here in this case XML and export them in a different environment or such needs. And then I have property stores. If you pay attention, this is Spring JDBC. Why is this important? we have spring config server, what is this property thing is going to do in addition to what you already have, which is spring config server is very powerful. We will see that is where some cool thing happens. I will explain in a while. Before I do that, uh, all these features are can also be exposed via REST interfaces. Why is that important? Because in most of the companies, either they are predominantly Java sharp or C sharp or something, but Every company will may, uh, may have a little components or systems that are probably not Java in a different technology. If you want to use the same feature store uh, to know the same feature is enabled or uh, disabled across the system, the REST API, that is one of the use case I can think. But it is available. So, that is a use case I am thinking and I came up with like you could use the REST API and then see whether the feature is enabled or not to integrate with non Java, non Spring applications. Now, let us see the cool thing that I was talking about. At least I found it technically very cool. Although I have not found a very good use case for it. <laughs> so, for a moment, I am going to stop 
my FF4J server. And I have a Spring Cloud config server here. So, this Spring Cloud config server, I created properties for a application called Edge Park and configured for QA environment. And to make it easy, I do not have my properties in the Git. Uh, instead of cloud, I did native. So, it is being served off of my file system. Once that starts, let us go to my postman. And let us retrieve the properties configured for Edge Park QA. So, the property sources, uh, it figured out uh, these two are applicable Edge Park and Edge Park QA as you know how Spring Config Server works. Now, key, uh, key, uh, take a look and the properties, um, maybe I will see if I can, I cannot maximize, but it is saying some hello property. Uh, S3 pro AWS S3 property and so on and so forth. Now, let me go back and start a different version of Spring uh, FF4J server. This version of FF4J server here is being integrated with Spring Cloud config. So, we will see what that means. So, FF4J has FF4J Spring Cloud config starter. So, FF4J has everything Spring uh, starter. So, if you have a spring, most likely they have a starter in FF4J. Now, let us see what happens to the properties. So, I enable security for this version of it. Is not it cool? This is the exact properties that you saw on the postman. So, you got a UI, brand new UI facing your Spring Cloud config server. Like I said, although I did not come up with a good use case, but I can think of a use case where your business, you have certain properties that are very business functional in nature and seldom the business is dependent on the developers to make the change and commit to the uh, Git and then you use your actuator uh, capabilities to refresh at runtime, right? But if they do not want to be dependent on um, developers, you could give this UI and then they can flip flop, uh, not flip flop, they can change the properties, but it is dangerous, right? Giving such a thing to the business and let them control. Um, but FF4J also has something like feature owner. So, you could create a owner for the feature and then say only these people can modify the properties. But uh, one thing here not, not, uh, do, do not, uh, will not make this is so dangerous is one is that property owner, the second thing is that these are available right away at runtime for the moment. But for the change to take permanent, like for, to make it permanent, you still have to do your usual thing to commit to the git and uh, refresh the cache. But I found it cool. Now, let us go back to the presentation. Oh, before I go to presentation, now I want to demonstrate another FF4J capability. So, I, I had been going through the UI and administration so far, but not many developers like to use the mouse, but they are more of keyboard and they like to see your dollar prompt as opposed to, you know, clicking. And not only that, you may want non-head kind of capabilities, especially if you are in a cloud environment, you have so many VMs, so many environments, you do not want to log into multiple things and you want one console from where you want to access different environments and manage these things. So, FFRJ has something called CLI. So, it is a it is again Spring Boot based and all I had to do is download and then make couple of configurations to configure where my feature store is and then run the Java, I mean jar. It is a runnable jar. Now, let us see what happens when I run this CLI. it has help and it can connect to multiple environments. To simulate multiple environments, what I did, one environment is the, the, uh, the thing that ha I had been demoing, then I created another environment called a dev that I loaded off of my file system. Now, let me connect to my local environment. It is secured by 
credentials. Now, you see all the features and there is a help. So, you could pretty much do everything that I demonstrated via UI. You could create a feature add, uh, and modify the feature and add strategies, delete and everything, toggle them. Now, I will quit off of this environment and now I will try connecting to my dev. A different set of features, which is quite cool, especially when you are uh, doing quick deployments and then you want a single console to manage. And they have they have much more capabilities than what I demoed, um, like uh, JMX, um, MBeans are exposed and all that. You could use that also to manage your features. Now let me quickly jump back to my presentation and then see what we covered and we covered that administration pitfalls. That is very important. So now talking about pitfalls, that is a statement I copy pasted from Martin Fowler. He says, release toggles particularly are the last thing you should do. First choice should be break the features down so you can safely introduce parts of the feature into the production. So he says the best strategy to implement release based uh, feature toggling is to not do it. And <laughs> business toggles are okay. Why? Because it requires a robust engineering process. You just, because it is cool and available, you cannot use it until you have a robust engineering process and you have a solid technical design and most importantly, mature toggle life cycle management. Like you should have a plan as to when you want to recycle the certain features and how you want to and how intelligently you want to group them. Otherwise, it is going to be the worst technical debt for a couple of reasons, we will see. The second thing is testing. So until now, you are so used to writing the test cases, your unit test cases probably when they are all on. Now you have to do two sets of test cases, when they are on and off, that is the best case scenario. It is best case scenario because it is a feature is on and feature is off is two options, right? But it gets complicated and may get exponentially larger sets of unit ca uh, cases when you are nesting them. Um, like for example here, so I have uh, I have uh, a strategy where you could actually nest your features. That means you are saying enable a expression strategy. So you are saying enable it if F1 and F2 are true. So they are predicates and now you are creating predicates off of the predicates. Now are this, uh, this is enabled and that is not enabled, but the combination of something else is enabled, this can get complicated and then you may create so many permutations and combinations of your test cases and not only that when, uh, when you want to recycle, it is going to be a nightmare because which one, if you recycled as SEF1, then that has an impact on this expression as one because now that is not going to work because SE F2 is tied to SESI F1 in expression S1, uh, SESI 1, right? So it is going to, that is why it requires robust engineering process to do it. Now let me go back to my presentation. I think with that, I am done demoing my presentation and before uh, uh, I and I want to thank a couple of people. Jim Shingler, you would know who he is if you are a frequent Spring One visitor and watched his presentations. And Ralph Maria over there, platform architect Pivotal, who had been extremely helpful in giving a lot of input into this. And then Tech Elevator Cleveland because I can tested on them this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and here I included some links. The so, some links where there is some comparison and available feature toggling frameworks, commercial and open source in the market. And I also included certain bad use cases and how people got into trouble when they did not use it correctly. And then on the other link section, so I also included my GitHub uh, URL where you can download all the source codes and run them. So, everything that I demoed is in the GitHub. Q and A. Now, I think, how much time do I have? Oh, good. Okay. Sure. Regarding the exponential risk of missing some flip-flops or some flipping, how would you address 
apply this into a, I don't know, 100 microservices strategy, one, ser one uh, FF for J <coughs> server, or is one for each microservice? You can have multiple clients. This is, so the m server is a store of features. So multiple microservices can uh, be tied to the same server, and they can say they are independent. So the server is independent. It is microservice agnostic. It's, it doesn't know who are all the clients. It doesn't care who are all the clients connected to. So any client can connect. That's why I said uh, even non-Java applications can use the REST API, and then see all you want to do as a client is to check if a feature is enabled or not. So that's how it is independent of the number of microservices you have. No, so it's not person. Yeah, segmentation. So the question is whether there is a segmentation or you are saying for a person. No, it's not for a person because we said at the beginning it's a role. That role probably is coming from your uh, who you had your federation partnership with, which could be your LDAP, right? And those roles can flow into it because it's spring security. What you are saying is what is your role, not a person. So that's how you can segment your. Uh, users user group users are assigned a role yeah so users can have like for example admin beta in, in the example that i showed you that's a beta tester user group so you have uh, created that group and uh, you assigned that role to that segment of the users Hmm. You don't have a role assigned to them yet. Hmm. Uh, can you still do this kind of segmentation on those users? Say you have millions of users. Coming. Okay, so some custom kind of segmentation. Exactly. So the last thing that I. Uh, I showed you in a slide where I saw built-in strategies. The last one is custom strategies. So I did not have time to show, but actually I even have some JUnit test cases that I don't have. I thought I will not have time, but I ended up having time. But then you can create custom strategies. I have a couple of them. So you could uh, extend it, like they have abstract classes and interfaces, and that you could, anything you want to do, you can do. Yeah. Evaluation happens on the client side. The client side. Yeah, but uh, how the evaluate? So the client also has FF4's a core as a dependency. So although I said it is happening on the client side, but what is evaluating that automatically is FF4z. So in the uh, so beta user test case also, that's one of the differences when you look at other frameworks, other features. I had to do no coding, right? So all I had to do is inject Spring Security Context Manager into FF4J context. So FF4J is auto introspect, like it is able to introspect and understand the user and roles, like the Spring Security aspects, and then it is able to do it. So if you create a custom strategy also, all you do is inject your strategy into FF4J execution context. So whatever your strategy says, your strategy pattern. So whatever your strategy says, that implementation will be enabled or disabled. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the Okay, so that's independent of feature toggling, right? So you could only say whether the feature is enabled or disabled, but whether your deployment is propagated is a separate concern. Well, if multiple clients are uh, trying to consume, I, I'm not talking about the code that is on Okay. Uh -huh. So, say you enable this feature, how is the propagation managed uh, that so that if there are multiple clients uh, who are asking if this feature is enabled, are all uh, receiving? 
Oh, okay. So how? Ah, oh, that, that's a very good question, actually. So that's because they are connecting to the same feature store. So they all get it at the same time because it's not event. There is an eventing possible, but this is the way this is configured. The current demo is not via eventing. So that eventing is enabled, but I did not demo that aspect of it. But if you use the REST interfaces, maybe you could use the eventing. Then you have to ensure whether this client got it, this client got the event. But the way I demonstrated is by connecting to the same feature store. So it's all at the same time happening. Yeah, so there is no update here. The update is, uh, it's connecting to the same feature store. When the update happens in the feature store, it is readily available because no eventing is happening. So anytime it needs to evaluate something, does it go out to the server to get the config? No, that's why I'm saying they're connecting to the same feature store. Here in this case, JDBC, right? Same database. But eventing is possible when you use uh, REST interfaces and you are not able to connect to the same feature store, then you would use, there is an FFRJ event thing, then you could use that to event it. In which case, what you are asking is valid, then you have to somehow ensure that they all got this update. I don't know how you will do it at, because I did not use the eventing, but the best thing is to connect to the same feature to store. So then you don't worry about the eventing. These are predicates. How do you how do you ensure that that uh, feature store stays highly available? That is this is a Spring Boot application, right? That is like any other application that you make sure is available. So any application that, this is not any different than any web application that you are building. So it's just at a data at a data level, like what's what's the back end? Okay, that's I, I think a good question because here in this case I used JDBC and I, as I showed you FF4J, Spring JDBC connector and then MySQL, but it also supports more than, uh, so I also use MySQL connector, but it has connectors for various set of databases and it also supports NoSQL, data, uh, NoSQL kind of databases, not just relational, and it has ready-made built-in libraries built to connect and are backed by caches. Like it has Redis, it has ehcache, all. Like if like that's why like I said, if Spring has a starter, FF4J almost has a starter. So if uh, Spring can support uh, re, uh, Spring application, Spring Boot application can support caching, then there is an FF4J caching also. So they have libraries readily available for Redis and whatnot. So I chose MySQL because that is easy. But then there are no SQL options and um, more. Yeah. Turn it off or on? Hmm. Uh, time of the day is available. As you saw, it's a, there is a time also. It is a date time strategy, not date strategy. Because it is easy for me to uh, just change the date, I changed the date, but it is time also available. Yeah. Like especially the office hour strategy that I did not demo, but I showed the feature created, it is just time based. Um, so to begin with, FF4J is Java Spring based, but that's why I showed the REST endpoints. So if you are Angular, can make REST calls, and that's how you have to. No, you don't have to use. So they have FF4J has JSP tag lips also. Uh, they have time lift dialects. But I did not know that they have anything for Angular or anything. Simple HTML. Uh, if it is a simple HTML, how how will you even connect to the backend? You need something to. 
Yeah, so that's why I said if you have rest capabilities, then that's how you have to. But there are no ready-made uh, Angular, JavaScript like mini, some ff 4 mini.js or anything that I am aware of. Yeah. I did not promote. So the question is, how did I promote it? I also oh, one way I can think is that the import export option that I showed you, you export everything, and maybe you could check that into. You could uh, source control it, and then you could import it. It can be exported into I think a couple of formats. XML is by default, but it can be uh, customized to have. CSV or something. That's your implementation. You so if parsing a data is the functionality that you are building. Now you, I don't know if I understand your question. So, so for example, let me tell you a use case. Yeah. Uh, let's say there is a banner on your UI, yeah. which you want to toggle. Like so you want to toggle that banner on, but you want to dynamically pass the data for that banner. So okay. F F four J doesn't make any functionality. It doesn't. It's not meant for. Uh, Delivering some functionality. The fun delivering the functionality is still on the client. It's only to on and off, flip flop. Not built in, but custom, maybe, <laughs> yeah. It's enabled. For example, if there's a cron job. Right. So if they want to start a cron job. No, it's not for, oh, I, I get your question. Um, not start the cron job because you have cron job to do that already. But what happens within the cron job, probably like you want cron job to do x versus y. If that has capabilities of accessing the same features to FF4J core, core is for core Java type of applications. So you could, you could do x or y, but not kick the cron job itself. You can't, that's why we said robust engineering process in the pitfalls. It's still on you to do the homework. Again, we have to do the coding changes. No, that's what, that's what. Any feature toggling framework, I did not say any feature toggling framework that did not have if else, except at least in my experience, this. This at least has that AOB based thing where you can have multiple implementations. That's inter it is easily detectable. So its problem is how easily can you detect? Your if elses cannot be easily detected. As long as you can detect, in which case you can look introspect or inspect all your interfaces, versus you look in through the cord and the nested if elses. So, so this is powerful. Uh, it very, I mean, it has to be used with responsibility. Not flip, feature. A feature is a user story. So you could have a user story or a couple of user stories nested under a feature. <laughs> I 
think that concludes it.